I'm going to sort of resume, I suppose, where I left off. I guess it was uh, almost three years ago when I, I spoke here last, and and um, that's been one of the most amazing things about this whole story in some ways, is that um, it has worked so consistently from one step to the next that um, in a rather short period of time, we've been able to accomplish most of the ideas that we thought would be possible then. So I'm going to give you a summary of, of where we are, what we think we can do with this um, technology. And it was started, as, as you, some of you may recall, by this very gifted uh, graduate student, Valentino Gantz, um, who at the time was uh, studying a fairly esoteric uh, matter about how you put the positions of these veins on, on, on a fruit fly. And of course, you, you, there were, I think, maybe four people in the world who really cared much about that at the time, and, and two of them were us. Um, <laughs> But um, what happened is that he got a little frustrated in trying to analyze the same problem in a more distantly related um, uh, insect. Uh, and it was a time when the whole CRISPR revolution was starting. And the CRISPR revolution allows one, as I'll get to in a moment, to um, essentially make whatever genetic change you would like in the genome. Um, in a way that compared to previous methods was relatively effortless. And so he had been a master of how to do this in the, in the fruit fly, and then it was his uh, attempt to generalize it to this other insect that had a different pattern that was informative that led him to this idea. And since then, he has done a short postdoc. He graduated, of course. He got, f I think, four different uh, awards, uh, including the Chancellor's uh, Award for, for his graduate work. And he was awarded a DP5 uh, grant from the, the NIH, which is a, a very prestigious first starting grant. So he now has his own research group. And, has, and is going gangbusters. He's a very nice, brilliant guy, and all of these uh, illustrations are, are his. So he's also an artist. So anyway, what um, the CRISPR uh, system is, is uh, it's a two-part uh, system. The blue is, represents an enzyme called Cas9 that has the ability to cut DNA um, on both strands. And DNA is a double-stranded um, template of inf information storage. And then uh, another little piece, which is called a guide RNA. An RNA is b essentially very much like DNA, except it's single-stranded. And it can also pair with the DNA. It has a U instead of a T. That's the only real difference. But the bottom line is, is that this little piece here, this can be synthesized in a machine and sent to you. So you put in your computer what it is you want. And the next day, it comes back. And then you just add it to this blue enzyme, which is easy to produce either genetically inside of a fruit fly or biochemically in a test tube. And then when they're combined, they'll cut the DNA pretty much anywhere you want. There's a tiny little constraint here. There has to be this little sequence called a PAM site that allows the um, <clears throat> protein to align with the sequence it's going to cut. But all the rest of this can be anything you want. And so it can cut the genome almost anywhere you want. And then you can make any kinds of changes you want in it which is the standard use of CRISPR that has sort of revolutionized genetics in the world. And this is largely the work of, of scientists like Jennifer Doudna and, and, and Feng Zhang at, um, at Harvard. So Jennifer Doudna is up at UC Berkeley. And she's the one who really um, had the insight to make this into a two-component system and easily used. So if you take this little uh, molecular scissors and you cut DNA with it, you know, you get two, chrom you have two chromosomes, well, one you got from your mom, one you got from your dad. And if you say you cut dad's chromosome over here, um, a cell that has that cut in it will die unless it fixes it. And so there are two ways you can fix the double-stranded break, as it's called, because it's cutting it right across. The first is a kind of error-prone pathway, which you can think of as sort of desperately trying to stick a piece of bubble gum in the break, just to t put the, you know, glue them back together so that the cell doesn't die. And it creates some mistakes at the junction, but at least the chromosome is in one piece, and so that it survives. And the thought was, by most people at the time, that this would be the predominant pathway because it's what people see happening the most often when people look in cells of the body. But it turns out that there's this other pathway, which is a very precise pathway, which, what, with, where the cut here is repaired by sequence information that comes from the other chromosome. So if dad's chromosome got cut, they would take the intact, it would take the intact information from mom's chromosome and fill in the gap. 
and this process is not so common in cells of our body. It happens, but it's 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 less frequent than this. But in the cells, it turns out for good you know for good luck on our part, the cells that give rise to the germline, the reproductive cells, this is the only pathway true that actually takes place. And in a certain way, in you know retrospectively, I, we didn't realize this at the time to be honest, but retrospectively it, when we analyzed it, it makes complete sense because in the germline cells, what goes on normally is that you scramble information from the chromosome you got from mom and dad and then that's what you give to your kids. So you have to cut and paste chromosomes to do that, but you don't create mutations. Sexual reproduction isn't mutagenic and if, it, and if this were happening then it would be mutagenic. So it kind of makes sense in the end that this is what's going on in the germline. So it turns out from a, a, a lot of the work we've done subsequently that if you're careful to restrict the activity of the scissors, just put the scissors in the cells that are going to give rise to the germline, then pretty much 100% of the time this is what happens. And if it's not 100% of the time, it's because the, the scissors are active in other cells of the body that allow this to happen before you can get to this. But the bottom line is, is that this is a very efficient process and, um, and it allowed Valentino to sort of, uh, you know, implement a, an ingenious little device that he came up with. And so his idea was you take a little piece of DNA that you can grow in bacteria in the lab, these little circular pieces of DNA called plasmids, and you put on there, you encode on there the Cas9 and the guide RNA. So these are DNA sequences that, that lead to the production through DNA going to RNA to protein of the Cas9 protein, and this just makes the RNA. So those are the two pieces that come together. And then this region of DNA corresponds exactly to where this thing is going to cut. So it, the, this, when they, these two pieces come together, they cut here, and this little red box is exactly this little red box. This little red box is exactly this one. So this site here, this side here, corresponds to the cut site, exactly. So what happens is that when this DNA gets cut, it gets fooled into thinking, is they, this is dad's chromosome, it gets fooled into thinking that this is a little version of mom's chromosome. So it hops down here, copies this information, and then hops back up here, bringing this information into the gap. And so now this is in the DNA uh, of dad's chromosome, but it can make now the scissors again, and the scissors cut mom's chromosome, and when mom's chromosome gets cut, it, the same thing happens. It goes, oops, I gotta go up here, copy some information, and it copies this cassette, as it's referred to, into here, and now both mom's and dad's chromosomes have it. So now that's a completely different thing than before. You know, it started off on just one chromosome and now it's on both. And so, you, you know, the parent only has two chromosomes, so it's got to give this genetic element to all of its offspring. There isn't any other choice. And so here's a little demonstration of this in a fruit fly where it, a fruit fly body starts off in a nice little brown color here. And if you cut this gene that's responsible for making this brown color, then whoosh, it becomes yellow. And this is what Valentino saw, and I, I remember it was uh, December uh, 18, 2014, when this happened. And uh, he walked in and he showed me these yellow flies where every single one of them was like that, and I've never seen anything like this before. The yellow gene this is referred to is one of the standard genes that's used as a genetic marker because it's easy to s distinguish a yellow-bodied fly from a brown one. And so people use it all the time. I've used it thous in thousands of crosses myself, and I know how it behaves. It always behaves in the standard way where you have to have two of the copies that are mutant before you see the defect. And here we were seeing the defect right away in, um, in, in individuals. It was a really amazing experience. I still can't quite believe it's true. <laughs> So, you know, the standard thing, again, just to kind of put this in perspective, is that if you have a mutant uh, allele, say a, a mutant version of a gene that would make for the yellow body color compared to the wild type or the normal, which would make the brown body color, then what would happen is you'd get one copy of each, one from the mutant, one from the wild, with, with the normal, the wild type, and because this is a recessive mutant, that is you have to have both copies mutant to see the defect, you'd see that Half of the chromosomes came from the mutant. That's 50% allele. Allele is a version of a gene, is the technical word for that. And the phenotype, the characteristic of the animal would be 100% normal because, again, it's got one good copy and one bad copy, and one good copy is good enough. So that's what I was used to, okay? But what happens with v Valentino's little gizmo is the same thing happens initially. You get one copy from the mutant, one copy from the wild type. But then the difference is the mutant one converts the wild type one to the mutant condition. 
And now you have a very different thing where 100% of the, of the uh, alleles or, are from the mutant and the characteristic is 100% mutant. So again, you know, you can imagine it, uh, if you had, say, um, you know, a, a blonde person and a dark-haired person that, that mated, typically they would, um, they would have dark-haired kids, and then if two kids like that mated, then they could have a quarter of their kids that would have blonde hair. But in this case, it would be as if the blonde characteristic were like this. It'd be like all their kids were blonde, all their grandkids were blonde, all their great-grandkids were blonde. It's a fundamentally different way of inheriting things. Okay, so as time's gone on, we begin to refer to this process broadly as active genetics and this self-copying element in, in, in contrast to the standard genetics where genes are just inherited randomly or in a kind of passive fashion. And so there are many different possible uses of it. And um, I'm going to start off by talking about this um, uh, application. Um, that can't refer to called gene drives that allows one in principle to disseminate anti-malarial uh, genes to neutralize the malarial parasite um, into, into populations. And, and then because these elements have an inherent capacity to spread um, in a, a consistent uh, way, it's also good to develop, we've, we've figured, um, elements that could neutralize them. And so I'll talk, first start talking about that, and then I'll get over to some of the other activities that they can be used for. So again, the ideas with mosquitoes is imagine that you have some beneficial trait that is indicated here in green that, is, it, it, that you have on one of these self-copying elements. These, the, they're called gene drives because they, they kind of drive themselves through a population. And so if this animal mates with a wild-type mosquito, then um, all of its kids get the, the green trait. And then if they mate again with normal mosquitoes, because we start off maybe where these are not very common, then um, all of their kids get it. And they mate again with wild-type mosquitoes, and pretty soon all of them have it. And this is basically an exponential process, and we calculated that it takes about 10 generations or so to go from having the green ones at only 1% in the population to having them throughout the entire population. And mosquitoes have about 10 to 20 generations in one season. So in principle, this could be accomplished in one year, but perhaps at least in two. So malaria is one of the um, most significant health threats currently in the world. Um, and mosquito-borne diseases as a whole are probably estimated to be one of the biggest killers. Uh, Bill Gates uh, estimates that mosquitoes are the number one killer on the planet, just a little bit ahead of humans who do a pretty good job too. But, <clears throat> um, but in any case, mosquitoes are infecting and uh, with malaria at least um, two million people um, a year. And, and then of those, about half a million die. But the other uh, 1.5 million often have serious problems with it, and it can cause an, an enormous amount of what's referred to as morbidity. They don't die, but they aren't able to work. It impacts how their kids go to school. So it's a, it's a, a very impactful disease, and it's a miserable disease to have, and it's an incredibly excruciating and painful death that affects largely children. So it's a really terrible disease, it really is. The more I read about it, the more I, 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 I find it a terrifying disease. And people who live in malaria endemic areas are as afraid of malaria as we tend to be in the, in the developed world of cancer. It's a terrible disease and it is um, incredibly frightening to people who, um, who live in malaria endemic areas to get it. And so in the, in, in the last uh, t 10 years or so, there have been enormous uh, efforts that have been uh, sort of regenerated after a period of lapsing uh, attention to, to this disease where they use a variety of, um, uh, of measures. The, probably the most effective are insecticide impregnated bed nets. So they take bed nets and they fabricate them in such a way that in insecticides are actually part of the fabric and the part of the fibers. And so a mosquito lands on that net, and through the contact with the net, the insecticide gets into the mosquito, and it kills it so that the bed net provides protection, and also it kills the mosquito. And then there's indoor residual spraying, where what they do is they have long-lasting uh, spray mixtures that they paste onto walls, spray onto walls, and that is very helpful. But the problem is, is that insecticide resistance has grown. There are many insects in the world that are resistant to as many as three or four in different insecticides. And so these bed nets 
units aren't working nearly as well as they used to. And then there's, of course, just getting rid of standing water. That's a big deal, actually. It's a, a huge effect. In fact, this alone pretty much eliminated malaria from, from, the, from North America. Um, and, and then, of course, there are, uh, are things uh, that are very important, a very important area are, de are developing anti-malarial drugs that people take to cure a person from, um, from malaria. You know, quinine was the first one. Artemisinin is the most recent one that was recently awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of that. And there are combinations of these that are, that are used. But there again, um, the parasites are developing resistance to that. And so there's a, a widespread uh, consensus that new tools are needed. So the way malaria works is that you have a, a person here who's infected with the parasite. They get bitten by uh, a mosquito. That mosquito then um, gets the parasite in it, so it's turned a little pink here. And then it flies over unpleasantly and it bites another person. And then it gives them the parasite. And then it, that's um, how, it, how it spreads. So there are two strategies that are out there to um, block this process using genetic systems. The first is they use this, uh, genetic, this gene drive system to deliver something to mosquitoes that, with a delay, will kill them. Okay, and um, so that's often referred to as suppression. It'll kill them or it'll sterilize them. It'll reduce their numbers. And so if you do that, then what happens is you, the mosquito just goes away. And of course, because the mosquito goes away, the uninfected person remains uninfected. That is, for sure, the, you know, the best way to do that if you want to make sure that the person doesn't get bitten at all. But in a sense, that's really just a genetic form of an insecticide, isn't it? It's just the same thing. You're killing the mosquito. And the, it suffers from the same problem as an insecticide, which is that mosquitoes become resistant to it. And not only that, that even if it works, you wipe them all out in a given area, but then they come back. That's the problem with insecticides. The, uh, um, the Western Hemisphere at one point uh, was uh, uh, cleansed of the uh, invasive species Aedes aegypti that carries dengue fever, Zika, and chikungunya, and so forth. But then uh, after that was done with DDT, but then. Um, of course, it came back because it can come back on another ship, and so that's what happened. And so it keeps happening if you, uh, it'll, it'll keep coming back if you do this, and we'll get into that. So the other approach is what we call a sort of an immunizing approach, or you get a mosquito where you don't kill it, like Kent was saying. What you do is you just make it so that it can't pick up the parasite. It never got pink, you see, so then it can't transmit it. So it bites, but it doesn't transmit the disease. So again, these two strategies, population suppression, you, you force a lethal or sterile mutation into a population, and um, there's evidence from the group that is the leader on this, uh, Andre Cassanti is the head person at uh, Imperial College in London, that they have one that works very well, that um, does uh, be, perform more or less as expected. And it would reduce all the diseases that are carried by a given mosquito, because if you get rid of the mosquito that carries one disease, dengue, it'll also get rid of the same mosquito that could carry chikungunya or Zika. Um, but the weakness is that it's not stable, just like any genetic, it just any, like any insecticide. A genetic insecticide suffers from that same uh, liability. And although I don't honestly think this is an enormous concern, there are people who are worried about the potential harm that could come from deleting a species from the environment. And of course, we're doing that at a prodigious rate. And contributing more to that probably isn't a great idea overall. Now, in the case of mosquitoes, I'm not sure it's that big of a deal. But if you, if you generalize this to other areas like island conservation, I'll get to that in a, in, in a moment, then there you're talking about getting rid of a mammal. And then what happens if you got rid of too many mammals? I mean, of that kind, would you maybe harm an endangered species eventually? So, um, so this is something to think about. I don't know that it's so, such a concern for mosquitoes. But our strategy is to modify the characteristics or phenotype, the characteristics of the population. And the strength is that it's stable because it doesn't reduce the mosquito population. So it's, you don't have to worry about them coming back. You just get this genetic element to spread through them. You're not getting rid of the mosquitoes. So even if there's a lapse between when you can get into a certain population, so for example, my fantasy there is that imagine there's a little isolated population of mosquitoes by a waterfall. If you use the first one over here, you could wipe out all the mosquitoes around there, but not have one actually fly into the waterfall. Then everybody's dead. It's like an Ebola epi you know, epidemic. Everybody, all the mosquitoes are dead around there. And then eventually, one of the ones from the waterfall flies back out, and then starts the whole thing over again. But with this strategy, 
what would happen is they would surround the waterfall and they would remain there and then eventually one of them would fly into the waterfall maybe a year later and then you know inoculate everybody at the waterfall too so this is far more stable and as Kent points out um, it should also do the least amount of ecological harm because it doesn't leave an empty ecological niche but the weakness is is that you have to then make one of these for each disease because you do them one at a time so but if you can do it in principle for one there's not any real reason why you can't do it in principle for more than one and I'll talk about the so-called updating elements also that you could use that could um, help with that so again as, as Kent pointed out uh, we collaborated with a, a, a person now uh, who's become quite a good friend uh, Anthony James or Tony James up at UC Irvine and he has spent his whole career um, developing genetic technologies in mosquitoes he was the first person to make transgenic mosquitoes with it had foreign DNA in them and then he spent about a decade developing these very sophisticated genetic devices by the way this is a this Vitruvian mosquito is another uh, drawing from Valentino. He spent about a decade developing this clever little genetic um, element here um, that has a region of DNA that turns on a gene when a mosquito, a female mosquito, as the one, they're the only ones that bite, when a female mosquito has a blood meal. So, you know, as you can imagine, there are genes in the mosquito that are necessary for digesting blood. And the way it works in a mosquito is that when she feeds, those genes get turned on because there's no point in having them on if she hasn't had a blood meal, and then she starts digesting. So you can take that little genetic switch that turns the gene on in response to blood, and instead of hooking it to the normal digesting gene, you hook it to what's called an effector, like a single chain antibody, which is a genetically encoded version of an antibody. It's just an antibody, literally like an antibody that we'd have in our own bodies but you can make a genetically encodable version of it and so now when the female has blood she activates the production of an antibody that binds to the parasite and ends up killing the parasite blumping it together one way or another it makes it so the parasite is unable to go through its normal maturation and so this is now a dead end for the parasite and it blocks transmission these are so-called um, uh, transmission blocking antibodies and at the very end of the last paper he'd written, at the time that Valentino came up with his little genetic widget, um, it ended the, he, Tony ended the paper as that if his genetic system, which he had shown to be 100% effective in the laboratory at blocking uh, 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 malaria transmission, if it was coupled with a mechanism for gene spread, then malaria resistance transgenes, these genetic elements like this, could become self-sustaining disease control tools. And so I thought, oh, this is perfect. We'll, I called him up and I said, do you want to uh, you know, hook your little genetic device to ours? And he said, sure. And so um, Valentino then went through a pretty heroic effort to create a very large el genetic element that with enormous pains by Tony's lab got inserted into the mosquito genome. They screened for 25,000 larvae to find two that got this in them. But when they did, they found that this genetic element was transmitted instead of the normal 50% rate at about 99.5%. So that's a phenomenal um, percentage. It's like almost 100% get them. And again, I think the reason is, is that if you can target it, this, this genetic scissors just to the germline, those that make the reproductive cells, it's the only thing that can actually happen. That's why this is such a high number. And so since then, we've developed a variety of additional um, mosquito um, systems that, that behave uh, with, with, with great efficiency. And so the idea is that if you take these mosquitoes and you release them, say, at around 1%, then in following this sort of initially exponential and then tapering off curve, which is called a logistic growth curve, you could go from 1% to 100% in roughly 10 generations. And this has been modeled now very extensively by a variety of other people, and it's always about on that order, whatever assumptions people make. And we've actually done experiments with, the, with some of the new ones, and they do exactly this. It's amazing. They actually do that. And I'll show an example of that in a moment for a different kind of uh, system, um, just to give you a taste of what the data look like. And uh, that brings us then to this issue of, well, 
you know, there's a, a thing called the Cartagena Protocol, which is an international agreement that is um, essentially uh, brokered through uh, this, the Center for Biological Diversity, which is uh, got an, it's an affiliate of the United Nations. And so it's not a binding document, but everybody except the United States, pretty much <laughs> every country except the United States has, has signed it. And so um, uh, there's an expectation that people will um, sort of abide by these kinds of rules. And one of the rules is that n no country Country should produce a, a genetically modified organism or deploy a genetically modified organism that could get into another country across the borders without the consent of that other country, which, you know, that does seem like a pretty reasonable uh, request. And so um, the problem with this is, of course, this genetic element has that property that it can go on spreading. So how do you stop it at a border, right? And so that is a tough question. I don't mean to say that we have any answer to that one. But the idea is, well, at least let's create a genetic device that can stop it, right? That would be a good thing. And you never know, you know, some crazy people might use this technology for things they shouldn't. There's always that possibility, you know, when you create a new technology that people could misuse it to. So the idea to be able to reverse the system or to neutralize um, the, uh, this sort of exponential spread of a, of a genetic element um, was sort of coming out with this idea of the first one we called an eraser. And it, it's a backronym, but really the point is that it's eraser, it, it erases. And the way it works is that it's got guide RNAs that combine with the Cas9, but it doesn't carry any Cas9 itself. So it's a genetic element that has only one of the components you need to make this process go forward. But and these two guide RNAs that it ha that it carries are designed to cut on either side of the gene drive element. So what happens then is the Cas9 that's produced by the active gene drive, which is blocked from copying because its guide RNA can't cut this eraser because the eraser is inserted into the exact same place as the, as the gene drive element is. So it doesn't have the site for this one. It's just not present on the, on the eraser. So it can't copy. This one can't copy here, but this guide RNA can, co can complex with the Cas9 that's produced by the gene drive element. And this one can do that too. The Cas9 can couple with, cu couple with this one. And then they can cut on either side to clip out the, um, the gene drive. And now that it's clipped out, you can see that the, what you really have is a, bro uh, a break in this chromosome over here where this piece has been deleted. And so now what it does is it copies through here and then back up through here. And now on both copies of the chromosome, you have the eraser. And when that happens, there's no more any Cas9. There's no more Cas9. And if there's no Cas9, then it can't copy anymore. And so you put an end to it. And you, know, you can um, uh, sort of model this um, going uh, as so, where you have a gene drive that goes through a population, kind of reaches 100%. And then at that point, you say, OK, we want to stop it from going any further. You release an eraser. And the eraser should be able to drive through a gene drive population in the same way that a gene drive can uh, propagate through a naive population. And then it replaces it. And it could also carry the anti-malarial effectors. There's no reason you couldn't put them on the eraser. And then after sweeping through the population, it would just kind of freeze the process. So that would be the end of it. Now, of course, the negative there is that it would no longer be able to um, spread into uh, a, if, if new mosquitoes came in that, that had malaria, it wouldn't be able to spread into them in, in any way because the spreading process would have been stopped. So it would slowly erode from the edges when you did that, um, if, if you did that. But at least it would potentially help consolidate uh, a border to that. And so this is just an example of um, <clears throat> a little experiment we actually did in the lab. Um, we're getting ready to publish this. We've done a lot of experiments with these erasers, and we've generated them in all different kinds of <laughs> incarnations. Um, and th despite the fact that they don't work nearly as perfectly as a gene drive, because they're a little bit more complicated, they nonetheless, through their cumulative actions, do quite well. So in this experiment, we had three quarters of the uh, fruit flies, in this case, as the test example, and uh, that had the gene drive element in, one quarter of them that had the eraser, one's marked with red, uh, as a, they have fluorescent markers on them, one's red and one's green, so we can follow them. And so then we can say, OK, what happens um, uh, with this particularly good one um, when, we, when we challenge them? And so it starts off with 25% of the flies, again, having the eraser, 75% having the gene drive. And within five generations, the eraser has completely replaced the other one and with very tight 
um, uh, distributions. And so that shows that this kind of technology really can work incredibly well. And this is actually n using a system that isn't a particularly um, accurate system. So it makes a lot of mistakes. And even though it like, makes a lot of mistakes, the kinds of mistakes it makes does not um, Im impede the actual um, the process. And so we believe in mosquitoes where the um, genetic copying of efficiency is much higher than it is in fruit flies typically. We believe that, or significantly higher, not much higher, significantly higher, that we think that this process um, could even be more efficient. So we do believe that this kind of system and others that we've developed um, to neutralize uh, these genetic elements are possible. Now, I'd just like to say a little bit about how we envisioned moving this forward. This is, again, the work of Tony James and the World Health Organization over the past couple decades that have sort of formulated the basic idea. And this is constantly being revisited um, by a, a variety of teams, including the Gates funding teams and, and, um, and our own uh, participation in the process. And the idea is that you start off, of course, as we already are, doing um, laboratory experiments and laboratory cage trials, ones like that I just showed you. And we've done similar ones for mosquitoes up in Tony's lab that have, again, shown incredible performance just, just like that. Um, five or six generations, it goes to 100%, starting in that case from 10%. <clears throat> And then after that, you move them to a phase two where you begin trying to test them outdoors. One possibility is in large uh, outdoor um, but contained um, uh, field stations. Um, they're not great in the sense that they're really not outdoors when you do this, but at least they sample the outdoor air and and weather and, and things like that. The best is if you just do them on a confiled, confiled, confined field trial on something like an island. So there are several islands that have been identified by Tony's group and, and, and this fellow Greg Lanzaro, who's a field ecologist. And discussions are now at a pretty advanced stage with several of these island uh, nations as to whether or not they would be um, uh, open to um, trying this kind of um, thing out. And so where we are with that is that um, they are collecting mosquitoes from those islands to set baseline information. And they're in open discussions both with the governments, regulatory and regulatory agencies, as well as with um, uh, you know, communications with the public. And so if these then go well, the idea is that in, it could move then, if, uh, if, if everybody agrees to it, to uh, phase three, where you, they're really st uh, staged open field releases on continental scales or subcontinental scales, like Madagascar would be an example of a subcontinental scale. And then, of course, you get the implementation and surveillance and so forth. And throughout this process, it's important to have regulatory oversight, community engagement, communications. And again, this has already been started on some of the islands um, in Africa. And, and it's also beginning now in India, in the area that we're working with um, here at UCSD with a group um, in Bangalore, India, um, as a collaborating um, team. So I'd then like to switch a little bit to this idea of other kinds of genetic elements. One of them we call chasers. Again, it's a backronym that's not very important, but it kind of the idea is that it would chase after a gene drive. And it only, it's another example of, a, of an element that has only a single guide RNA, it only has guide RNAs in it and no Cas9. So in this case, for example, one of the guide RNAs would be used to target it so that it copies itself, so that it would insert it in the genome, and then this one would then be used so that this genetic element could go on copying at that location. Then it could have another one that, for example, has a guide RNA that um, renders mosquitoes refractory to transmitting the malarial parasite because it changes a protein in the gut of the mosquito from a version that the parasite normally binds to to a version that the parasite has difficulty binding to. And this protein FREP1 is an example of that. And there's a, a version of the protein that is fully functional but that just doesn't bind the parasite very well. So you could have a guide RNA that works it out so that you get just the parasite unfriendly version. And again, there's uh, uh, another guide RNA you could have here that attacks a version of uh, uh, a gene that's involved in nervous system transmission, the sodium ion channel, that um, can be mutated um, from 
a, a residue of leucine at position 1014 to phenylalanine, F. So you have a 1014 F mutation, which is one of the most common mutations that is, uh, that is observed globally um, in mosquitoes and, and, and other insects as well that renders them insensitive to DDT and pyrethroid insecticides, currently the most implemented insecticides, the safest ones. And so I'll tell you a little bit about how we, can, we think we can do this. We just had a, um, a, a, a paper published where we pr provide proof of principle that you can actually do this. And so the concept is like this. So imagine you have a gene drive element over here that has two guide RNAs, one that copies it, that's used to copy itself, and another one that is used to target a gene, that a, 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 a cut site that is sensitive to it. So it's, it's, and when it cuts the sensitive version, then there's a break there. And then this break gets repaired by looking to the other chromosome that in this case is designed in such a way that it can't be cut. So one can get cut, the one you don't like, and one can't get cut, the one that you do like. And so you, the one that gets cut gets repaired by the one that can't get cut, and then you transfer, you transform the, the allelic version you don't like, say the insecticide um, uh, sensitive uh, version, uh, the insecticide resistant version, to uh, an insecticide susceptible version. Okay, so again, um, the, the wild type uh, version of the sodium ion channel um, the, is, um, in, in this case, would be insensitive to the cutting of the of the um, uh, of this guide RNA two, whereas the insecticide resistant version would be susceptible to being cut by this, and so you would basically. Um, start off in a background, a genetic background that had the 1014L mutation in it. That's how you would, the 1014L normal um, uh, uh, amino acid in it. That's what you would build in the lab, and it could carry the anti malarial effectors as well. And as it sweeps through the population, if it mates with a, fly, with a mosquito that has either the F or S mutation that render it insecticide resistant, then it would cut this version and repair it with this version so that they'd all come out looking like L's. And the same thing with this gene FREP1, where the most common amino acid is the one that is exploited by the parasite, and there's a rare amino acid that it cannot be. And so what you would do is you would generate mosquitoes that had this rare version of it that's not friendly to the parasite, and if it mated with uh, mosquitoes that had the more common friendly version, it would convert it to the less friendly version, and thereby, again, render the mosquitoes, not only, not only have the mosquitoes become immunized uh, through antibodies to the malarial parasite, but also just inherently less susceptible to being infected, and maybe also, um, at the same time, uh, resensitize them to um, insecticides. It costs about $100 million to make a new insecticide, and they're becoming, um, and insects all over the world are becoming highly resistant to them. So something like this would be a far less expensive way to re to give increased longevity to existing uh, and newly emerging uh, pesticides. So finally, I'd like to just kind of look at this same kind of element that doesn't have the Cas9 embedded in it and, and, and look and see what we can do. In a certain way, you can think of a genetic element that has the Cas9 embedded in it as a car where the accelerator is, sta is stapled down. So you can't stop it. It just keeps going. And you can imagine that that's a little inconvenient if you want to park it. And so um, it's better than if you have an accelerator where you can take your foot off the gas. And so um, that's what we, th these elements we call copycat elements are like that. So the copycat elements have guide RNAs in them, but no Cas9. And then um, we call them copycats because you can CC them or copy them to the other chromosome. So then in the, if you then provide Cas9, by putting the accelerator down in a controlled way. And basically what this means is the Cas9 is just somewhere else in the genome in a way that you can cross in and out in a regulated way. Then in the presence of Cas9, they, cu they cut the uh, chromosome that's opposite to them and they copy themselves. And you can combine two um, elements that are very close to each other or on different chromosomes, it doesn't matter. And, um, and then these can then be um, used uh, to, uh, to do a variety of different um, activities. And um, 
One of them we could think of is that imagine that you wanted to make a mouse that you humanized for various uh, genes so that you could study in the mouse um, a process. So, you know, uh, for example, make them look more like a human being to study Alzheimer's disease or diabetes or, um, or um, asthma. So there are models in mice for doing that, but part of the problem is, is that they, when they screen for drugs in them, they obtain drugs that work really well on mice, but then when they test those drugs on humans, they just don't work at all. So if you humanize the mice so that the mice had the same corresponding target genes as humans do, the hope is, is that those drugs would work a little better. And another example are genes, for example, that metabolize drugs. So mice and humans have totally different environments, and they metabolize drugs in completely different ways. And so if we could replace the metabolic uh, um, uh, pathways in mice that metabolize drugs with those from humans, then again, they would probably serve as a much more adequate system for uh, drug studies that, um, that are ongoing. And so that would require as many as 10 different changes to get made. And so what you can imagine is you have Cas9 here that's in the genome that's inherited in a standard way, just like one copy from mom, one copy from dad, and then these active genetic elements that don't have the Cas9 but have the guide RNAs that allow them to copy in the presence of Cas9. So if you copy two such um, uh, mice with have two different such elements, then the result would be is that the, the offspring would have one copy of each and the Cas9, if, if you select those that have the Cas9, and then these elements being active elements in the presence of Cas9 would copy themselves onto the other chromosome. And then you could take an animal like that that had both of them and cross it to another one that, say, had already had this happen a couple times. And then the progeny would have each of these elements in a single copy, still with the Cas9. And now um, they would copy themselves. And the result would be they have all of these elements so then you could find, if you're satisfied, okay, we've got as many as we want together, then you could cross two animals like this together, and now because this is on one chromosome and not on this one, and the same over here, you could look for progeny that inherit the chromosome that doesn't have the Cas9, and now you would have all of these assembled, but in a stable way, so nothing's copying anymore. That's the idea of having the accelerator, you know, off, uh, t taking your foot off the accelerator. And so now you'd be back into this sort of standard realm, and, um, you'd be able to um, pursue this sort of genetics that you would with this. And then if you had this model system that was, say, th that was humanized for drug metabolism, and then you had a whole other one that was equally complex that was a good model for Alzheimer's, then again, you could combine them with Cas9 for one generation and um, get all those elements from both of them in together, and then they would all copy. Then you cross them one more generation, and you get rid of the Cas9, and now you've, in a modular way, assembled all these different genetic things. So that's a completely transformational way of, of doing genetics. And it could also be applied to plants. And in plants, there's even an additional level of, of importance, which is that unlike us and mice that only have one copy from mom and one copy from dad, many plants are what are known as polyploid. So wheat, for example, has six copies, three from mom, three from dads. Peanuts have eight. So do um, uh, uh, um, um, sugar cane. So they get four from mom, four from dad. So imagine that you have a favorable vari genetic variant, one that grows under poor soil or one that's resistant to drought, and you'd like to combine two of those across all eight different copies. I mean, that would be a nightmare using standard genetic tools. But with this, they would be all cut um, by the same guide RNA, if you engineered it right. And then after crossing them back, you would be able to have them all um, carry those, um, those traits it together. That's the idea. But as a first step in that, um, we collaborated with K Kim Cooper here at UCSD to, cha to do the same kind of thing that Valentino did with a coat color mutation. So remember, Valentino made brown flies yellow. So this uh, mutation in the, what's called the tyrosinase gene causes what's known as the albino mouse, a white mouse. And so again, um, the question was, could this genetic element be made to copy um, in such a way that then the, uh, the, the offspring would have this fluorescent marker that was carried here. And then there was a way of distinguishing the, the target chromosome from the original chromosome by carrying this additional mutation here. So if it had this mutation and it was red, then that would be evidence for copying. And so the first thing that they did was they used a source of Cas9 that was produced everywhere in the body. And that turned out to be very good at inducing mutations. That is, it would, it would take this chromosome over here, cut it, and do that NHEJ thing to it. 
but it would not copy the element. So all that we found were mice with one of these in one system that were completely white because all of the chromosomes that were across from the genetic element got mutated, but um, uh, unfortunately, none of them inherited the element, and one of them did it in a kind of spotty fashion here, so they um, looked like little Dalmatian mice. So it's very good for making mutations in mice, but that's not what we were trying to do, although there are uses of doing things like that. I mean, actually, there are some uses for it. But then the idea was, well, if it doesn't work when it's on in all cells, how about this idea of just restricting it to the germline cells, the reproductive cells? And so um, when she did that, um, now, she found that um, it, it copied, and in five families, the average was 44%, and in the best one, it copied 72% of the time. And because half of the time, you get the copy that was um, the donor chromosome anyway, um, by copying 72% of the time to the target chromosome, that means that the average transmission rate is, is 86%, because 50% you get for free, and then of the other 50%, you get 72% of that, so you take 36 and you add it to 50 and you get 86%. <laughs> That's how that works. But the bottom line is, is that this frequency isn't so much below what we see in mosquitoes. It's a little bit less, so if we could optimize it to get a little bit better than this, that would be good. Then there was another problem, too, which was that <clears throat> In, uh, in, this, uh, in her experiments, the um, copying was observed through the female, and that, we believe, is because it was possible to intercede at, this, at a very early stage in the embryo just as the female germline was being created. But the problem with the male is the male goes on making germ cells into adulthood, so there are many more cell divisions in which you can introduce those uh, intervening um, mutations, those, uh, those uh, enjoining mutations that are the ones that come from being in the cells of the body, the so-called somatic cells. So this process didn't work in mice, uh, in males. But the idea, though, is it's probably still the same, is that for females, you can do it this way. For males, you'd have to probably get the Cas9 scissors expressed more at this stage in later in, in, in adult development and that kind of stuff. Th these are the kinds of experiments that Kim Cooper's lab is, is currently working on. But it certainly shows good proof of principle and it shows that you could Im do um, what uh, is proposed in, in principle in combining many genes and it also could become a tool that would be useful possibly for island conservation because you could use gene drives of that suppression kind to potentially help uh, eliminate mice, uh, rats, and so forth from um, islands that are nesting sites for endangered birds. That's the idea of the island conservation people. So we're working with them, and Kim's working with them to, to look into that possibility. I'd just like to sort of summarize things that are going on on campus here. I've told you about the work that's going on in mosquitoes. We're also working in fruit flies. Um, I didn't mention, but we are also trying to see if some of these uh, tools can be generalized to somatic cells. Somatic cells don't do this very well, but we're thinking if we make them a little bit more like germ cells, maybe we couldn't. We're collaborating with Steve Hedrick to do that. I told you about the mice. Uh, Debbie Yellen is also trying to show it in zebrafish. Marty Yanofsky is trying to show it in plants. There's a project in yeast. There's also a project in bacteria that, um, that um, isn't shown up here. But this is a uh, this has blossomed since I spoke to you last into a campus-wide effort where pretty much every one of these efforts is going forward in a productive way, which is really amazing to me. And you know, just we're in, in collaboration with Bill McGinnis, who's a very close friend and collaborator. He was just recently elected to the Nobel uh, to the um, National Academy of Sciences. Um, we're trying to figure out how genes that determine the position of the body parts, how they might be working using this kind of technology, and. As I mentioned, Kim Cooper, who is the one who did the gene drive experiments uh, in mice, she's also interested in trying to figure out how these jumping mice evolve these long back legs compared to their little short front legs from you know, the standard little rodent form. And Debbie Ellen is doing uh, fish and so forth. And um, you know, there's also big advances that we, we think we can do in genome engineering. I mentioned um, this idea of how you can use guide RNAs to cut at a site and, and and propagate a favored genetic variant. Marty is working <clears throat> and is very close to analyzing what could be going on in plants. And then we're working with Victor Nizet's lab, and a paper we just sent out for publication um, shows that this process can work a thousand times better um, at, uh, at combating uh, uh, 
antibiotic resistance than the standard uh, existing version by making these little genetic elements that self-propagate in bacteria. And although that might be kind of a no-brainer because this technology originally comes from bacteria, actually bacteria on their own do not repair double-stranded DNA breaks. So we had to act, actually had to introduce some genetic information that would do that. And remarkably, with those pieces together, they behave almost exactly like a little mosquito and boom, those little pieces of DNA copy themselves. So it's one of these things that it's been uh, just an amazing experience from my point of view. I've, you know, I'm kind of toward the end of my career, really. And um, I, so I've had a long time where I've struggled like almost every normal scientist has with amazing amounts of failure and frustration and these glimmering moments of success where, you know, you think, okay, fine. You know, after five years, we finally got this thing, you know, six years to get a paper into a good journal or something. And then this process where almost everything we try works because I think it's just a really simple thing. This genetic element's like a genetic paper clip, and paper clips work to hold things together because they're simple. And they keep working because they keep being simple. And so I think that's the lesson that we've learned here, and we're just remarkably fortunate to have been able to, uh, to be present in this sort of new experience exciting stage of genetic d development. And so again, I'd just like to end by uh, recognizing Valentino, who started this whole process out. He got these four different um, uh, graduate awards for his PhD, this early uh, independence award. Shannon has been a member of the lab for a long time, a senior technician, and she's contributed to almost all of these experiments. Annabelle's the one who's showed this so-called allelic drive, that is the ability to copy a preferred allele over a non-preferred allele. Hanna is the talented graduate student in Kim Cooper's lab who did the mouse work. And we've had the benefit of many, many collaborators here on campus, some of whom I've mentioned, and non-UCSD people, Tony James being the notable one for uh, setting up the collaboration in Mosquitoes, uh, Greg Lanzaro also who does the field work. And of course, we'd like to be grateful to the, uh, we are grateful to the people who support this work, the NIH, the Allen uh, Frontiers Group, and um, the Tata Institute for Genetics and Society, which is funded by the Tata Trusts of India. Thank you.